in this video, we're going to talk about a fallacy that often doesn't get quite so much attention as some of the big heavy hitters, the appeal to exclusivity. We're going to cover what the appeal to exclusivity actually is. Then we'll look at the argument structure, how it's put together. We'll discuss why it's a fallacy, what actually goes wrong in this kind of argument. Then we'll look at some common situations in which you can expect to see it arising. We'll discuss three examples of the fallacy. If you want to see further examples, we'll have other videos that are just focused on, on giving you a whole bunch of examples. We'll look at how you might be able to spot this fallacy when it's occurring or also when you're committing it yourself. We'll talk about other fallacies that sometimes people mistake this one for. And then we'll finish by talking about how if you want to avoid the, this, this fallacy in your own thinking, your own reasoning, your own discussions with other people, you might be able to do that. So, what is the fallacy of appeal to exclusivity? The best way to think about it is that it's a reversal of the appeal to popularity. So the appeal to popularity, which many people are familiar with, um, this is a good mnemonic device, many people are familiar with the appeal to popularity, that consists in saying, look, a lot of people think this is true, so it must be true. Or a lot of people think this is a good idea, so it must be a good idea. This goes the other way. It says that, a lot of people thinking something is true is probably evidence or reason to think that it's actually false. So it argues that because many people believe a claim to be true, therefore the claim is actually false. So either the opposite of it is true or some alternative claim is what we ought to believe to be true. And I've noticed this being called, uh, but only in a few places, the smart-ass fallacy or being a wise pioneer. And I put a little facetiously here, but only by the cool people, because that's really what the appeal to exclusivity kind of turns on, is the idea that you're in this, this select group, and the rest of those dummies over there, they, they believe that, but that's exactly why that's wrong. Smart people believe this. So what's the structure of the fallacy? You notice that we've got an implicit premise uh, getting us from the an original premise, the one that's actually going to be articulated, all the way down to the conclusion. And the first premise runs, many or most or all people believe that X is the case. And this is very similar to the appeal to popularity, isn't it? Because that, that's how the appeal to popularity goes. But instead of saying, aha, so therefore this is true, it goes the exact opposite direction. It says, you shouldn't believe X to be the case, but instead believe not X or believe Y, believe something else. Now, how are we getting from the premise to the conclusion? How are we getting from point A to point B? We're saying that, well, when many people believe something to be the case, it actually is not the case. So we're taking, instead of like in the appeal to popularity, where we take many people believing, to be the case, believing something to be the case as the hallmark for it being true, we're actually saying, no, most people are stupid, most people are wrong most of the time, so if most people can get behind something, we're going to say that's not the case. That's the, the hidden premise. Uh, another way to look at this would be, along these lines. You notice I've got this represented graphically. So you got the viewpoint of what we're going to call the ignorant majority, right? The mass of people think that claim X is true, but they're all idiots. So, you know, what, what do they know? And, it, you know, the, the fact that the mass of people think that it's true means that those people also think that you should think that X is true, but you're not one of those people. You're not a conformist. You're, you know, you're smarter than them. So therefore, you should think not X is true. That's the structure if we lay it out. Now, why is this a fallacy? What's, what's going wrong here? The same sort of confusion that marks the fallacy of appeal to popularity is, is going on here in this fallacy, the appeal to exclusivity, but it's going the other way. So there's a confusion that's taking place between a claim being false or unsupported, and that's one thing, and a claim being accepted or believed by many people. There can be cases where a claim is accepted or believed by many people, and it's a false claim, you know, like, for example, when, when many people believed in witches, um, 
Or when, you know, supposedly, it wasn't actually the case, everybody in the world believed the world was flat in the Middle Ages. We know that's actually not the case because we see Thomas Aquinas and Anselm and people like that saying, well, as we all know, the world is round. But um, we, we do have a kind of a popular conception of the Middle Ages, don't we? So we can say, well, you know, most people think that the Middle Ages were a time when everybody thought the world was flat. So therefore, that's, that's true. Um, in this case, it's going the other way around. We're saying that uh, people think X is the case, therefore X must not be the case. And, and these are two different things, aren't they? So with some exceptions, and, and we can talk about those in other places, the truth or the falsity of a claim does, really does not depend on it being accepted by many or a majority of people. We want to get away from the habit of thinking that whether a claim is widely accepted or whether a claim is widely rejected tells us anything about whether the claim is actually true or not. And we have a lot of experience of, of historical examples where it actually turned out that the majority of the people, and not the elite or the cognoscenti, were, were right. Where uh, what they call the, you know, the, the power of crowds or the wisdom of crowds actually turned out to be such. Not every case, but sometimes. What are common situations where you're going to see this happening? So it occurs in advertising. It doesn't occur in advertising um, in the same way that appeals to popularity go. Appeals to popularity, you aim it at a mass audience, and you're going to get them to say, well, look, everybody's drinking this beer, therefore I should be drinking that beer. Or doesn't that look like a great party over there where everybody is uh, wearing these clothes? I should probably wear those clothes as well. Instead, it works the other way around, it says. You don't want to be like the rest of those people. Drink this beer, because this is what cool people, not all those other poor slobs or those people who don't know good beer, you drink this one, because then that sets you apart as somebody who really, you know, is in the know. We see this in aesthetic judgments, judgments that have to do with music, with food. The whole fashion industry is in a certain sense at least, you know, except for the stuff that's, you know, marketed to the masses, based on this notion of exclusivity, that you can, you can purchase a product and the better people think that this is, is the thing to wear. All those dummies down there, they don't know. But, you know, you buy this and you'll be, you'll be in with the rest of us. Some policy discussions uh, where there's an appeal to what the elite uh, hold to be the case, and you say, well, you know... Um, obviously, we, you know, 95% of the people are against this policy, but that's because 95% of the people were for slavery or 95% of the people were against this. Or, you know, I mean, we don't want to like depend on what the ordinary person thinks, do we? Or this, the, these, these popular appeals, it's sort of doing the opposite thing. Uh, religious and anti-religious groups uh, both fall into this sort of thing from time to time. And what do all these contexts have in common? You've got cases where an elite can be distinguished from a mass. And it appeals to a part of ourselves that wants to see ourselves as smarter than other people, as having information or insight, or, you know, well-developed taste or appreciation that they lack. Class is, is another way of putting it. And... You know, many people do try to use this as a guide for reasoning about their own purchases, lifestyles, other decisions. One of the saddest things that's, that's expressive of this is to see people who run their lives according to fashion magazines or men's magazines or websites that tell them, this is what, you know, this is what the cool people do, not like all those other dummies over there. Um, everybody else thinks that this is a bad idea, but we think it's a good idea or you can think it's a good idea because you can be guaranteed that if most people are against it it's probably the right thing to do or if most people are for it you don't want to be one of them now let's look at some examples here i've got some metal band stuff uh because i'm into heavy metal and this is something i actually know something about and this is kind of an interesting example for me to pick because i actually do dislike uh, what's happened with Metallica, Van Halen, and Def Leppard in the recent decades. Um, but when I went on and I, I looked up who are the you know, top best-selling metal bands, these guys are in there. So somebody might make an argument like this. 
True, Metallica, Van Halen, and Def Leppard, they're some of the best-selling metal bands of all time. But those guys are sellouts. They, they got to be so popular by making stuff that could cross over and appeal to mass i.e. non-metal audiences. You don't want that weak milk toast, milk toast stuff, right? You don't want that watered-down uh, metal. You want real metal, don't you? That's what, what you need. Here, I got just the band for you, Manowar. And, you know, if you know anything about metal, you know that Manowar never did sell out. <laughs> they have songs about, you know, real men play on 10 and, you know, cool stuff like that. Um, now, what makes this a fallacious argument? So, in this case, it's kind of funny, because Metallica, Van Halen, Def Leppard, they actually did do crossover stuff. That's also why I, I myself, as a metalhead, don't like them. Um, I quit listening to Van Halen after they became Van Hagar. I quit listening to Metallica after um, Cliff Burton, you know, was no longer playing with them. And I quit listening to Def Leppard uh, after they came out with uh, Hysteria, which was terrible. Um, but let, let's assume that, so let's assume I'm making this argument to you. Um, and we could do this with any other sort of bands. This is an argument that's appealing to ex exclusivity. These other bands, how can you tell that they're no good? Because a lot of people listen to them. Because a lot of people say that they're good. But we know that other people aren't a good judge of, of music. And whatever is popular that's probably a sign that it's no good at all, that they're just a bunch of sellouts. They're pandering to the lowest common denominator. So we want to pick the most obscure band we possibly can. Man of War, by the way, would not be the most obscure band. We'd have to find some, you know, some metal band that's, being, that's an undiscovered and uh, resuscitate them and say, now this is what you really need to listen to. Um, so that's one example. Another example. This one's uh, a medical or, or sociological one. ADHD, misdiagnosis, and malingering. So here's an argument you could make. You could say, look, ADHD or whatever else you want to call it because you keep on changing the acronyms is one of the most popular diagnosed mental illnesses today. Jimmy claims that he's got it, so we should make some exceptions for him. Uh, but he's just one of those sheeple who buys into popular ideas about ADHD. And the conclusion is, well, this guy doesn't really have it. He's just, he's just malingering. We're not gonna, we're not gonna make any exceptions for him. And is, you know, this is a little bit of a different structure here. We're talking about saying most people would, would say that this is the case, but most people are stupid. So we're going to say that that's not the case. Um, Jimmy is, has been placed under this diagnosis, but we know that this, this diagnosis is mostly BS. We know that um, it's, it's just popular to say that you've got that, and you know, it'll, it'll get you by. So we're not going to make any exceptions for him. Could be that the guy actually does have ADHD. Could be that ADHD is a real thing. Could be that um, you know, he's got some, some chemical imbalance that, med that medical treatment will help him out with, or he needs some coping skills or something like that. So, you know, this, this would be an example of that argument. And my favorite one, example three. By the way, full disclosure, I am actually working on an apple right now. Um, but the, uh, the flip side of that is, it, you know, I worked with PCs for about 20 years, and it took a lot of convincing to get me to, to use a Mac. And I do see some utility to it. But I could never stand this Apple Think Differently campaign. Um, and here's the verbatim short form of the, the commercial. Here's to the crazy ones, the rebels, the troublemakers, the ones who see things differently. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Now, the conclusion of this, the one, you know, they never actually spell this out, but the ad is, is, is supposed to lead you to saying, buy Apple, and you'll be a genius too. You just carry around your, your Mac or your iPhone, and aren't you a smarty? Uh, not like those other poor slobs who use PC or Linux or, or whatever. Um, so, what's the argument here? The argument is, look at all these other people who are, you know, in the know. They're not conformists. And if you buy Apple, you'll not be a conformist either. All those other people want you to buy PC. 
but they're they don't know they don't they're not creative they're not the intelligentsia you want to be in there don't you and so this is this is an argument um, an appeal to exclusivity as well how do you spot this when it's occurring so here's a couple guidelines just like with the the appeal to popularity um, pay attention to reasons that a person provides for why you should accept a claim are they involving negative references to numbers, to popularity, to most people? Here's a keyword, conformists. Um, if they are, then you might have an appeal to exclusivity taking place there. Ask yourself, is the matter under discussion one in which the number of people who believe it to be true is significant for the truth or falsity of the claim? So, you know, think about craft beers, for example. Um... How many people can, can appreciate craft beers? I think a lot of people. Um, so if, if a craft beer is popular, does that mean that it's not really a craft beer anymore? That it's, you know, they've sold out in some way, they've popularized their taste, it's not, it's not true, or, you know, it's not up to, you know, what, what a real craft beer enthusiast would want? I don't think so. I mean, this is a, a good example of, of uh, a case where the number of people who believe it to be true probably doesn't have anything to do with the truth of the claim. Also, watch out for people who seem to regard a lack of popularity as one of the most or even the only significant factor for deciding whether something is true or not. And who would this be? Uh, three groups in particular, and I suppose to this we could, we could add hipsters, but they really fall under elitists, don't they? Contrarians, people who always want to go against the norm and think that going against the norm is, is a good thing in and of itself. Elitists, people who want to stress their distance from, from the masses. And, uh, you know, modern day hipsters would fit in there. And I'd say conspiracy theorists, because conspiracy theorists are often given to saying that, you know, most people are, are um, in, you know, in a state of denial or ignorance or being manipulated. And only they actually know what's, what's really going on. Let's talk now. And this is primarily geared towards students who need to be able to tell this fallacy apart from other fallacies. Let's talk about what's not the fallacy of appeal to exclusivity. So, arguments that invoke the viewpoint of an expert are not usually instances of appeal to exclusivity. They're usually going to, if they're fallacious, going to be instances of appeal to authority. With appeal to exclusivity, you're saying... Uh, most people think that something is a case, but most people are usually wrong. So we're going to say that this is, you know, what we should think instead. That this isn't the case or something else is the case. If we're bringing in an authority, we're changing the structure of the argument. Um, arguments that suggest that we ought not believe something because people have believed it for a long time are a different but related fallacy called the appeal to novelty. And the appeal to novelty is to the other fallacy of appeal to tradition as the appeal to exclusivity is to the appeal to popularity. They bear the same basic relationship. So it's easy to mix them up, I think. And you might also mix this up with one of the appeals to emotion, specifically the appeal to spite, which attempts to use or provoke feelings of spite or bitterness, those sorts of negative emotions against a claim or a person making it. And what would be going on there it would be more like you'd be saying, um, look, all these people like this band, but, you know, people are just stupid. And you don't want to be like those stupid people, right? You keep stressing the stupid, keep stressing that, that you know, uh, how, how they can't get it right, how, how um, there's this negative affect there. And you try to get the other people to feel that, that affect as well. And then they, you know, they make the decision, no, I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to believe this instead. The last thing I need to say is not every argument that brings up or emphasizes the fact that many people believe or choose X, and therefore, you know, we, we shouldn't um, buy into it, is going to be fallacious. There could be some examples where, um, you know, if you know, for example, that most people tend to, to have a uh, confirmation bias going on, and, you know, you, you talk about political ideologies or something like that, then, you know, you could actually... Um, carry out an argument where you say, well, probably most people are, are wrong about this. Let's talk now, the last thing that we need to get to, how do you avoid falling into this fallacy? 
what can you do in your own practice, in your own life, to try to wean yourself away from this if you're doing it? So pay close attention to your own claims and your arguments, the ones you make to other people and yourself, and ask yourself, how much weight are you giving to popularity or unpopularity of claims? Is that the, is that the thing that you really want to be focusing on? Another thing that's very important, um, remind yourself that elitism often conceals just another kind of conformist thinking and that entire industries are actually out there catering to, quote, nonconformists. This Apple example uh, is, is a perfect instance of that. Um, all these people were carrying around Apple and, you know, kind of putting their nose in the air and talking about how great Macs are and, and feeling like they're really something because they're part of this elite crowd. But they're all, you know, being nonconformist together and in the same way. That's not really being a nonconformist. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's just a sort of narrowed appeal to popularity, isn't it? It's the popularity of your group that you, you care about in that case. Um, the last part that I would, a bit of advice I would say is, when you find yourself making an appeal against popular opinion or taste to decide some matter, ask yourself if there are other criteria by which you could decide that matter more reliably. Can you take the popularity or unpopularity out of the picture and appeal to something that's um, <laughs> a bit more objective, a bit, you know, a bit more um, reliable, something that other people could actually say, you're not just being an elitist here. The last thing that I want to say is that this, this video is part of a series discussing common fallacies in reasoning and argument. It belongs to an entire channel devoted specifically to critical thinking, reasoning, and argumentation. So if you like this video, um, check out the other videos in this series. We're, we're putting together a whole bunch of ser uh, videos on fallacies. But we're also putting together a lot of other series for critical thinking, for logic, for argument. And um, so if you like it, you know, keep coming back and seeing what, what we've got that's new and share it with other people that you, you think could use this as, uh, you know, something to help them out.